welcome, this is Amanda Rockinson Zapku, and in this tutorial we are going to continue discussing hypotheses and hypothesis testing. We're going to look at hypothesis testing steps 2 through 4, choosing a statistical significance level, carrying out the appropriate statistical procedure, and finally making a decision regarding the hypothesis. We're also going to talk about type 1 and type 2 error. So let's get started. After writing the research and null hypothesis or hypotheses for your research study, the second step in hypothesis testing is to choose a statistical significance level or an alpha. An alpha is always set ahead of time and it's usually set at a point zero five, point zero one, or point zero zero one for educational or social science research. The choice of point zero five as a criterion for acceptable risk of a type 1 error is the tradition or the convention. It's most often used, and this was based on the suggestion made by Sir Ronald Fisher. Now, statistical conservatives will tell you that if your alpha level or significance level is not less than 0.05, then forget it. Your results are inconclusive. However, experts that I respect, such as Jacob Cohen, or the late Jacob Cohen, um, he says that 0 .05 is not the cliff, meaning that sometimes it's acceptable to have a higher significance level. However, for the purpose of this tutorial as well as the other tutorials, we're going to use convention, which is 0 .05. So let's talk about what is this alpha level, what is this significance level? Well, as I've already implied or stated, it's the chance of making a type 1 error or the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true. Now let's say we set the significance level at 0 .05. This means that we are willing to accept that there is no more than a 5% chance that we're wrong. If we were to set it at 0 .01, it would mean that we're willing to accept that there is no more than a 1% chance that we're wrong. Another way to think about this is to say that we would expect to make such a mistake or such an error 1 in 20 times. For example, 0 0.05 is 5% or 1 in 20. One more way to think about this is with a significance level of 0 0.05, we want to be at least 95% confident that if we reject the null hypothesis, we've made the correct decision. Now in talking about significance levels or alphas, it's important to talk about directional versus non-directional hypotheses or one-tailed versus two-tailed hypotheses. Remember statistical analysis is based on whether or not we're testing a one-tailed directional hypothesis or a two-tailed non-directional hypothesis. Actually when you get into SPSS what you'll notice is that you have the option or the opportunity to select whether or not you're going to do a one-tailed or two-tailed test in the dialog box associated with the analysis that you plan to perform. Now, the issue of two-tailed versus one-tailed hypotheses becomes important when you're performing statistical tests and calculating the alpha level because it determines how that's going to be calculated. For example, let's say we're going to do a two-tailed test with an alpha level of 0 .05. The 0 .05 is actually divided equally between the left tail and the right tail of the distribution curve as you can see here in this illustration. So this means that let's say you are looking at the difference between group A and group B. If you state a non-directional hypothesis, you simply state that there will be a difference and then you test to see if that di difference is um, happens on either side, whether or not let's say group A performs better or worse than group B. So again, when you're testing a non-directional hypothesis, you conduct a two-tailed analysis. Now let's say that you have a strong theoretical and empirical basis to predict that group A will perform better than group B. If this is the case, you would state a directional hypothesis that group A will perform statistically significantly better than group B 
and therefore you would conduct a one-tailed test. In this case, um, you would look for a significance between the groups or a difference between the groups at a 0 0.05 level, but you would just look for it at the right or high tail of the curve, as you can see depicted here in this uh, picture, this illustration. Now, what you're doing is you're just then testing to see if group A performs better than group B. You're not concerned at all and you're not testing if group A will do worse than group B. Basically, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. Alternatively, you could say, or you could have a strong theoretical or empirical basis to say that group a will perform worse than group B and if that's the case you would then um, put all your eggs at the other side of the tail and so you would predict that group A would do worse than group B and um, your 0.05 would appear at the left end or the low end of the tail. Now as we're talking about directional hypotheses, I want to note here that a one-tailed test or a directional hypothesis should only be used when you there is a strong a prior justification for predicting the direction of the expected difference. As I've stated, you need a strong theoretical and empirical basis. Otherwise, a two-tailed test should be used or a non-directional hypothesis should be stated. And this is usually the case in educational research. Usually what you'll see is two-tailed tests. It's also important to note here that it's considered bad practice to do a two-tailed test. A two-tailed test, notice that you missed some type of significance and then change it to a one-tailed test. Because if you remember when we first started talking about step two, I said that your significance level needs to be set prior to conducting your research study and your analysis. The same is true about your one-tailed or two-tailed test. You need to choose to do a one-tailed or state a directional or non-directional hypothesis prior to conducting the research and doing the analysis. So this concludes our discussion about step two of hypothesis testing. We're now going to move on to step three, which is carrying out the appropriate statistical procedure. Now carrying out the appropriate statistical procedure first requires that you choose the correct statistical procedure that aligns with the hypotheses that you propose. This is discussed in detail in two other tutorials, so we're not going to discuss it in detail here. I want to refer you back, therefore, to the introduction tutorial as well as the tutorial that focuses on choosing the correct statistical analysis. But here it's important to note that step three is to carry out the appropriate statistical procedure. We now move on to the fourth and final step of hypothesis testing, and that is making a decision regarding the null hypothesis based on the results of your statistical procedure. Each analysis yields a test statistic and the probability value or p-value that the null hypothesis is false. This probability value is used to determine whether or not the results of the analysis are statistically significant or not and whether or not the, the null hypothesis should be rejected. Conducting a statistical analysis and examining the p-value can be likened unto a search. We're searching for evidence to reject the null hypothesis based on an established criteria. Now, if the p-level is equal to or lower than the significance level that you established prior to conducting the analysis, you reject the null hypothesis and state that the results are statistically significant. However, if the p-value is more than the significance level that you established prior to conducting the test, you fail to reject the null hypothesis and state that your uh, results are not statistically significant. So let's say that we set an alpha level of a 0 0.05. If our p-value is less than 0 0.05 when we conduct our analysis, we can consider that our results are statistically significant. Therefore, what can we say about the null hypothesis? Well, as I just said, if you have statistically significant results, you reject the null hypothesis. Now let's say we conduct an analysis and our p-value is greater than 0.05. We then would state that our results are not statistically significant. And then what can we say about our null hypothesis?
Well, if our results are not statistically significant, we then fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now you'll note that I just used terms such as failed to reject the null hypothesis or re I rejected the null hypothesis. This is because it's never acceptable to say that you're going to accept the null hypothesis. There are also some other words that you want to avoid when you're talking about hypothesis testing. It's always important to remember that hypothesis tests are statements about the likelihood or probability of a certain statement being true or not being true. The results of a hypothesis test should therefore never ever be presented in absolutes. Statements such as these results uh, prove the research hypothesis or the null hypothesis is false are not acceptable because one study or even 10 studies does not prove anything beyond a shadow of a doubt when dealing with statistics. Remember, hypothesis tests deal with likelihood or probabilities and there's always the possibility of, of having either a type 1 or type 2 error or failing to reject or rejecting the wrong hypothesis when it's actually true or the other one's actually true. So you really need to be cautious when presenting your results and use statements such as the evidence supports the research hypothesis or based on these findings we cannot reject the null hypothesis. I also want to take a moment here and talk about what happens if you have results close to 0 0.05. For example, let's say you have a p-value of 0 0.051. Well, then your results, and, and let's say that um, you have set your significance level at a 0 0.05. So what you need, what you cannot say is that you almost have significance or have marginal significance. Remember, if the if you set the significance level at 0.05 and your p-value is 0 0.051, it's above a 0 0.05, and the only thing you can say about those results is that they're not statistically significant. So again, don't use words like almost significant or marginally significant. When you make a decision, you can only use words such as rejecting to fail the null hypothesis, um, failing to reject the null hypothesis, you support or support the research hypothesis, or evidence supports the research hypothesis. Um, so be careful about the terminology that you use based on what you understand about st uh, hypothesis testing. Now while we're talking about p-values, I want to make a quick note here and aside. I want to note that a p-value can never be zero. A p-value of zero would mean that it is certain that there's no type 1 error, that no type 1 error took place. And again, we can't say that because we, like we've just said, inferential statistics is based on probabilities, not certainties. However, sometimes when you um, calculate your values in SPSS, what you'll notice is that you may ha have a, a p-value of 0 .000. It's important to note that SPSS truncates values beyond three decimal points. Consequently, in viewing your SPSS output, you may have a p-value of 0 .000. This always needs to be interpreted and reported as p is less than 0 0.001. So to summarize, after you've determined the results of your statistical test, you decide whether or not to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. If your results indicate no statistically significant difference, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. If your results indicate that there is a statistically significant difference then or a relationship, um, you then reject the null hypothesis. However, we have noted that there is always the possibility that you as the researcher could reach the wrong conclusion. And this is referred to error, specifically a type 1 and type 2 error. Now I've used these terms throughout this tutorial, but we haven't actually taken time to define them. So let's take some time to define them and look at some examples. Let's start with a type 1 error.
if the researcher rejects the null hypothesis, that is, they find statistically significant results, they reject the null hypothesis, when it's actually true, that is, that they, they shouldn't have found statistical significance, the researcher makes a type 1 error. Let's look at an example of this. Let's say a researcher concludes that um, a residential educational statistics course is more effective um, in helping students learn statistics than an online course. So based on this result, on these results, a university revises their entire online curriculum. They spend a lot of money doing that and they then require students to actually come to campus um, to take an educational statistics course. However, after all this expenditure of time and money and requiring students to come to campus, students don't seem to be improving in their ability to pass the educational statistics course and their course points seem to be just about the same um, as when they were taking the online course. They conduct then some other research or subsequent research and what they find is is that this research does not reveal results the results demonstrated in the original study. And ultimately, the null hypothesis is found to be not true. Or the results that are um, done, or the results that are seen in this additional research suggest that there's no statistically significant difference between the two types of courses um, on students' course points and their ability to pass the research class. Therefore, the, a type 1 error occurred in the original study. So again, a type 1 error is when a researcher rejects the null hypothesis when it's actually true. That is, they find statistical significance when there really wasn't any statistical significance. So that's type 1 error. Then we have, and I'll note, a type 1 error is often called the alpha. Then we have the type 2 error, which is called beta. Um, now, in type 2 errors, it's sort of the opposite of type 1 error. If the researcher fails to reject the null hypothesis when it's actually false, that is, they find there's no statistical significance when there actually should be, then the researcher makes a type 2 error. Let's look at a practical example of this now. Let's say a researcher concludes that there's no statistically significant difference between students' course points based on whether or not they take an online course or a residential course. That is, the courses are approximately equivalent in their effect. However, future research demonstrates that the residential course is actually more effective. That is, students learn more and they have higher course points when they take statistics residentially rather than online. Thus, it's likely that the researcher in this original research made a type 2 error. Type 2 errors are often made because, or often a result of, um, the lack of statistical power. That is, you may not obtain statistically significant results because the power is so low. And this is a concept that we'll review in another tutorial. But let me make a few concluding uh, comments here. Um, we can minimize the possibility of a type 1 error by selecting an appropriate or more stringent significance or alpha level. Unfortunately, these two types of errors that we're talking about are inversely related. So as we try to control the likelihood of committing a type 1 error, we actually increase the likelihood of committing a type 2 error. Since ideally we want our statistical procedure to correctly identify if there's a difference between groups or if there's a relationship between two variables, we need to uh, have an appropriate level of power, which ideally is 0.8, which I said we're going to talk about in another tutorial. And it's important to note that power is influenced by sample size, effect size, and alpha level. Therefore, these are all things that need to be taken into consideration when uh, conducting a research study and performing an analysis so that you minimize both the likelihood of type 1 and type 2 error. But as I said, um, power, effect size um, are things that we're going to cover in other tutorials.
Now in this fourth and final step of hypothesis testing, making the decision, we've talked about the fact that this decision is made based on a p-value and we talked about setting an a prior significance level and comparing the p-value and the significance level to make a determination if our results are significant and whether or not to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. We talked about type 1 and type 2 error. In talking about making a decision it's also important to recognize the limits of the p-value. When conducting research it's likely that um, you'll use statistical software such as SPSS. Um, and it's important to recognize the limits of this software and the limits of the p-value reported. These are limits that texts such as Warner discuss in great detail. So I'm not going to go into great detail about this here, but I do believe it's important to mention as it's something that you need to be aware of and may even be something that you consider controlling for. Now, in many research situations, the exact P values reported by SPSS are probably not accurate estimates of actual risk of type 1 error. Because of violation of rules and assumptions, the actual risk of type 1 error is often higher than the reported P values. And the P value probably estimates the risk of type 1 error less accurately in multivariate studies that report large numbers of analyses as compared to those that, ha um, that, are look or that only use like univariate um, statistics or variables. Now, my recommendation here is the same as Rebecca Warner and is consistent with the recommendation in um, the APA manual. And it's this, report the exact p-value for your statistics test. So run your analysis, report exactly what you find in SPSS, and then allow the reader to make his or her, her own judgment as to whether or not the p-value is small enough to judge an outcome of statistical significance. And also, so report the exact p-value, also acknowledge violations of rules and assumptions. So talk about the assumptions, the assumption tests done, and talk about violations and how this may affect the p-value. Um, how the, in other words, how the p-value reported may not be accurate. Um, and so this helps then the reader to interpret it. Now, um, because this p-value is not accurate, again, researchers and statistical um, textbook writers such as Warner suggest ways to control for this inflation. And we're going to um, take a quick look at a list of these different ways to control for this. Here you see a list of procedures um, to limit inflated risks of type 1 error. These are the procedures that Rebecca Warner suggests. She says, um, make sure that the sample is representative of the population about which you're making an inference. So that's one way to limit the risk of an inflated type 1 error. Set the criteria for statistical significance decisions before you take a look at the data. That's, we've already talked about that. Um, limit the number of hypotheses and statistical tests that you do. Use the bone Ferroni uh, procedure. Um, replicate these re the results or the study across multiple or additional studies and also cross-validate results within, uh, within a study. Now, again, what we talked about in this fourth and final step is making the decision. Remember, your decision is made on the p-value. However, there are some limitations to that p-value, especially when using statistical software. And again, these are just ways that you can limit that risk. We've now defined a hypothesis. We've talked about hypothesis testing in detail. We spent a good amount of time talking about how to state a null and research hypothesis. We then talked about choosing a statistical significance level. You should know that the convention you often used in social science and educational research is 0.05.
We noted that um, after setting a statistical significance level conducting the study, you carry out your uh, statistical procedure. We didn't go in detail here in this tutorial about that because we go in detail about it in other tutorials. And then finally we talked about making a decision regarding the null hypothesis and how we use the p-value to make that decision. And we also noted that all research always includes the possibility of making an error. So we talked about type 1 and type 2 error. We also talked about the fact that the p-value is sometimes limited and that there are ways to control or reduce that um, those limitations or the risk of a type 1 error. So that then concludes this tutorial on hypotheses and hypothesis testing.